Welcome again to 168. Um, if it's your first time attending, uh, my name is Vinay Goyal and uh, our TA is Leonardo. And we're both going to try to make the best to, to help you succeed. That's, that's the goal here. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, what is fine elements? Somebody very succinctly tell me what is fine elements in a, in a very complete sentence. I want a very complete sentence of what is finite elements. And I appreciate the, the, the attempt. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Breaking a problem into very small, definite, solvable pieces in order to determine the whole. And so, so she's, she's contributed significantly here. Can somebody add more to that sentence? So it's a strategic way to solve partial differential equations with uh, uh, so, 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 so let's combine the two definitions here. And finite elements is a systematic approach that allows you to solve partial differenti differential equations for, for a complicated domain. It can be complicated loads or boundary conditions uh, by using discretization of that complicated domain into simpler subdomains called elements connected to each other by nodes. And allows you to then uh, take the partial differential equation and turn it into a system of algebraic equations that can be solved, usually linear. But if it's a nonlinear problem, hopefully we'll get to that at some point in this class. Does that make sense? Uh, how many of you have started the homework? OK. So for the rest of you, uh, <laughs> you want to start now, OK, because uh, you know, so tomorrow there's discussion class, and, and maybe there's questions there, you know, and, and things will start piling up. They'll be piling up really quickly. And so my advice to you uh, at this top-notch university is to really crank it up every day. Put some amount of time every day. Because what I explained here, right, um, is going to go through one ear and go out through the other one. So, so I'm putting the effort. To, to teach you the concepts. And what I'd like you to do is, after the class, spend some time trying to review the materials. This particular uh, presentation has over 55 pages or more, I believe. And so, so the next one today has another 60. And the next Tuesday is another 60. And all these uh, lectures will be very dense. And very, you, you're going to have to pay a lot of attention, OK? And so for that reason, I really recommend that you uh, get started immediately, every single of these homeworks, OK? And every single one of these homeworks has a very particular trick that I put in there on purpose to try to drive a concept home, OK? And so for that reason, I think you should start also a little bit early. And I'm, I'm giving you all the tools that you need in this PowerPoint also. Uh, in addition, I really appreciate many of you have contacted me through email. Uh, but in addition to emailing me, emailing, me, emailing me, please copy Leonardo so he's aware of the questions that are coming up. So that way, uh, I've been responding to a lot of them, but at the same time, he can also respond as necessary. Okay? And also, I, I encourage, uh, if you have a question, post it in the forum and post also the, the answer that was given by us so everybody can benefit from the question and the answer. It will be very difficult for me to take every question and put the answer in the form. But if you can help with that, that that'll, uh, as a team, we can help each other as well. Okay? Well, thank you very much for listening to, to this uh, short uh, uh, sermon that I gave you. But I really need you to, to get started. So let's look at how um, we will implement such methodology in Abacus. You can do it really by hand, really quick. And you can see here, I took this two spring uh, system. I've, I've randomly put some numbers in here. So this number, no number, I call it 5. This one 6. This 7. Uh, this element number, I call it 10. This one 11. And the, look how easy. It, it's, it's very short. Um, but if you learn the lingo now, it's going to come very long ways when you move on later uh, in industry. Because uh, using the GUI is great. But uh, I'll tell you that the GUI can be a black box. 
And so looking at the input file and trying to understand how this connects to when you do things by hand also will be of great value to you. So as you can see, the first uh, section here, you define a node. You define a node number. You put the node number there. And you can see I put 5, 6, and 7. That's 5, 6, and 7 right there. And what I've done next, I put the coordinates, x, y, x and y. Okay, and 3D will be x, y, and z. And then next, what I have is the element definition. Now, each of these, you see the star element, star node. These are keywords that you can actually find in the Abacus documentation. So if you go to the Abacus documentation, how many of you have downloaded Abacus already? Very, very good. So, so the rest of you, it's time for you to download that as well. It will come with documentation. And that documentation, in the keyword section, you can find what star node means, what star element means. When you see two stars at the beginning, uh, this means comments. So you can write anything you want. You can say, this class is hard. You can do that too. Okay? You can use that section to comment. Uh, so the element type that I'm using is Spring 2. And Spring 2, what that does, it connects two nodes. So that's what I've used, Spring 2. And Abacus Manual is really, really good. You, you can actually learn a lot just by looking at it. There's a verification manual. There's a bench work manual. There's examples that they give you. There's actually people that have posted in YouTube many different examples of their own. So you can actually even learn. If you don't like Leonardo, you can actually go to YouTube and uh, somebody out there posts a tutorial on how to do something. Okay? But I think you're going to like him very much because I like him very much. So, so now you have element 10. Element 10 connects nodes 5 and 6. This is, this is called connectivity. right? So this is a connectivity matrix. This connects the element. That's the element number, and these are the nodes that go along with that. For element 11, what is the connectivity for the nodes? 6 and 7. So that's what you see there, 6 and 7. Okay? And then finally, in a Abacus, if you look at the manual, it says, okay, star spring to define the stiffness. And you see here, 1, 1, that just means that you're looking at deg degree of freedom 1. So since this is uniaxial, everything is in one direction. So that's why you see that one and one there. Uh, and then finally, here's where the solution starts. That's where you invoke the solution. And we're looking at a static solution. Uh, the boundary conditions are that the left-hand side is fixed. So node number five is fixed. And it's fixed. I put all degrees of freedom fixed, one through six. But in reality, it's a 1D problem. So it's just the one degree of freedom that's fixed. So you could also put one through one. And then star C load is a concentrator load. You can apply a concentrator load that's applied to, degree, uh, to a, a node number 7, degree of freedom number 1. And that's the amount of load that I apply, 10. And if you look, um, you know, we get the solution here. And if you do a hand calculation to get the deflections measured here and here, uh, which are given here, the values are provided here, you will see that it matches your hand calculation. It's, it's going to match. Okay. Does that make sense, everybody? Just a really quick synopsis. If you have additional questions, Leonardo will go a lot deeper into it. Okay? Both the GUI, hopefully we'll capture how to do it in the GUI and also by hand. In your homework, the one I gave you, you also have to use do it by hand. I want you to do all that by hand uh, to create that uh, input file by hand. Okay? Uh, so that, that's the goal. Um, Let's uh, tackle a case I did not cover. Um, I think I need to cover a little bit again uh, so that it's much more clear because problem number two of the first homework deals with this. And I want to make sure that's very clear how we have to deal with this particular problem. So let's look at a special case where you apply constraints that are non-zero. I kind of covered that last week, sorry, last month, Tuesday. But today, I'm going to go uh, a tad bit deeper. Not, not a lot more deeper, but just, just a little more. So uh, the original example I have given was a three-spring system uh, fixed on the left. Uh, so, so g equals 0. So the amount of deflection I'm applying is g equals 0. Uh, and on the right-hand side is a load applied p. Okay, so that was the original system. And we talked about that when there's a zero constraint, uh, just make the code number uh, 0 and 0, right? That's what we talked about. And these are the degrees of freedom that are left, 1 and 2. Okay? That was the original example. And we solved that. And we, we, we uh, manufactured 
the, the code number matrix, uh, and element 1 is 0 and 2, right? Sorry, 0 and 2. Element 2 is 0 and 1, and then element 3 is 1 and 2. So we, we devise that. Uh, for uh, the original example, we finish it up. We, we, we do all the work for the assembly. Uh, but for the modified example, the one I want to give today, so that you're able to do your homework, problem number two, more intelligently, is that let's say that this is a non-zero applied deflection, so apply one inch or half inch. Uh, in that scenario, what I recommend that you should do is don't make it zero. Make it one and one. Uh, so, so make it, make it a, 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 don't put zero for the constraint. Just put one there um, for that particular degree of freedom. Uh, and then uh, just number the rest of it, two and three, right? So my, my code number now is for element one is one and three. For element two is um, one and two. Is that correct? Is everybody tracking? Yeah? For element three, then I have two and three. That's the code number. And so now the, def the deflection or the displacement vector is basically G, which is known. This is like one inch, half inch, okay? D1 and D2. So what you do now is you're going to assemble it this way using this procedure. Uh, so you go and assemble it, and you can see now I've got a three by three uh, matrix. Before, in the original example, I had a two by two, okay? But in this example, I have a three by three because now I'm including uh, the non zero constraint in here. That becomes important because uh, what I want you to do is to be able to uh, go back to the, 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 the matrix here. The, the, all, the whole K is known. That's all known. Uh, what is the only unknowns here? Somebody. Sorry? D1 and D2. Those are the unknowns. Uh, but G is known. And since G is known, that there must be a reaction force. There's no load applied on degree of freedom 2. And on degree of freedom 2, there is a uh, a load applied P, okay? So all you have to do now is to use the procedure I discussed uh, in the previous lecture uh, to solve for D1 and D2, okay? You can do it by hand, so you can actually solve the last two equations for D1 and D2, uh, and then um, basically solve for, for the reaction force. But this is the automated process to do that, uh, if, you, if you wanted to do it with matrix notation, okay? Um, any questions there? I, I already covered this before, okay? But I'm covering a little bit deeper because I think you're going to need that for problem number two, okay? Just the non-zero constraint, is that just for, like, is there some practicality to that or is that just to learn? Uh, no, you, you can have situations like that. So say you have a heat transfer problem. Uh, in a heat transfer problem, I could apply a temperature. Well, that temperature is not, is, is not a non-zero value, right? In structural mechanics, most of the loads are applied, uh, but you don't apply displacements. They're usually fixed boundary conditions and things like that. But for other problems, I think it's important for us to learn these concepts. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so just to make sure for the video, the question was, is there any practicality to solving this problem? And the answer is yes. Uh, in structural mechanics, for my area of expertise, I've also applied displacement for several problems. Uh, it will take me a long time to discuss each of them, but th there is a lot of practicality here, okay? I'm going to try to make the class practical. The homework, of course, uh, in some sense is also practical because you'll try to discretize the domain for several different problems, right? Uh, but uh, I'm not going to give you a rocket or an aircraft to solve because it will take a long period of time. But I hope that at some point we can get a CAD model of a part and then we can mesh it and, and, and do that kind of thing. So, so I think that, that that will happen down the road, hopefully. Um, all right, so that, that's end page for Springs. Today, I'm going to transition to trusses. And then next week, I'm going to transition, hopefully, to uh, a strong form galerting. That's, that's the next topic coming up, OK? Um, so let's tackle, uh, let's tackle trusses today. And uh, Any questions? Any any thoughts? Any any um, anybody wants to contribute? I also welcome people that want to contribute um, from industry. If you're from industry and you want to give a lesson, learn about something you did wrong in fine elements, let's let's share that so that everybody else can uh, learn that experience. Okay. 
So that's, that, that could be a good thing. Today I found an error in a model where the coefficient of thermal expansion was per degree C, right, centigrade. But then the temperatures that were being used were in a different, um, in a different um, uh, temperature, uh, like Kelvin or, 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 or Fahrenheit. So we, we, we need to pay attention to that. Some people don't pay attention to that, OK? Let's look at a trust analysis example So uh, for fine elements. So uh, a, a trust, uh, in general, uh, you've seen trusses. And this is not just strictly for civil engineering. Trusses also show up in a lot of uh, applications uh, with uh, launch vehicles, uh, spacecraft, and, and, and other things like that. So, so I show a civil engineering structure because it's typical and it's easy, easy to show. But uh, if I look at a connection um, in a truss system, typically you will have a gusset plate. Uh, and you have members that are connected like that. Okay? And um, in general, uh, these connections uh, use large bolts or large pins. Um, but we're going to idealize that. Uh, we're going to idealize that, and you may have learned this in mechanics and materials, so this may be a repetition. But we'll idealize uh, that connection as a frictionless pin. And that way, now the system now behaves like a two-force member. It does not take any bending. Um, and uh, no moments will be transmitted through a pin. Okay? Uh, later on, we may be able to co cover frames, which uh, will be able to carry bending through the connections. Um, the weights of the members are typically neglected, uh, and uh, trusses now become a two-force member, meaning that the forces carried by each truss is only along the axis of the length of the truss. Does that make sense? It can only take load uh, along the length of that truss. Okay? Uh, from that perspective, um, if I look at the assumptions, uh, now basically you have a two-force member. Uh, each truss can either take compression, it can take tension, it can take compression, as you see there, but it will be only along the length of the truss. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes? Okay, so, so with, that, with that in mind, um, the, the strategy we're going to use with, with trusses is the following. Step one is to idealize this truss uh, uh, structure uh, to be discretized into elements. So that will be the first step. The second step, we're going to discretize the behavior of a local element um, because that's what we talked about. We talked about the first step is discretizing the domain. The second step is to approximate the behavior over uh, a, a general element, right? And then the third is to assemble the system together. Uh, and you already have learned a little bit how to assemble things, and today we'll talk about that as well. And number four, we'll then apply the boundary conditions and then we'll apply the loads and then solve a system of algebraic uh, um, uh, system of equations, okay? Algebraic system of, of equations. Um, so let's, let's look at this example. This example is a truss system. And uh, I, I've, uh, it's, it's fixed here at the bottom. It's fixed here at the bottom here. Um, and what you have here is uh, element numbers being, being sh shown, one, two, three, you know, four, five, six, seven. But in general, this is the truss system I'm giving you. And we're going to discretize it by calling out the, the element numbers. That's one, that's two, that's three, and so forth. Um, and um, let's see. So in the next slide, um, I think there's a pro um, Yeah, so let's continue here. So, so if I take one truss member and I try to understand its element behavior, Okay, I already know that that truss can only take loads along the length of the truss. And for that reason, I'll look at it. I'll look at it, and that's how this element behavior, at least the, the diagram for this element will look like. Uh, this node could move amount di. This node could move to the right and amount dj. Uh, and correspondingly, there will be a load, applied, uh, a load, internal load acting on this part. Um, that's, that's balancing the external forces being applied. So at the local element, you're trying to develop the element. We call it the element formulation. So, so anytime I talk about developing the behavior of a local element, 
this is called an element formulation, formulating how an element, a general element behaves. This idea in finite elements is if I can generalize the behavior of an element, I can now, I, I basically know the general behavior of any other element that has the same shape. That's the whole point of finite elements. It, it simplifies life, okay? It simplifies the process. So if I look at the stress acting on this bar, that's P over A. If I look at the strain, the strain is basically the relative deflection, dj minus di divided by the original length. Everybody knows this formula. Uh, changing length divided by L, basically. And so you know that stress is related to strain through what? Hooke's law. Stress equals uh, E times epsilon. How do, I, how do I know this relationship? Stress related to strain. How do I find this relationship? I have to perform an experiment. I have to do, use an instrument machine and load up the sample in tension, right? So uh, that's how I calculate E, right? Or if it's aluminum and I tell you the grade of aluminum, what will you do? You look it up uh, in a handbook, in a materials handbook for the particular grade of material you're looking at. You can also use Google, but you also want to, in industry, in real life, you want to really look at the particular grade of material you're working on, okay? And so now I have calculated uh, the relationship of stress to strain through Hooke's law, and that's how the formula looks. P over A equals E over L dj di. And so now if I bring A to the other side of the equation, I get Ea over L. That's basically spring stiffness. And I get what I had shown you uh, on Tuesday. It's, it's a stiffness matrix for a general uh, uh, a bar element. But there's, this is the problem. There's a problem with this. The problem with this is that um, I have bars oriented in different directions. That's a problem. So th maybe that formula that works very well for the bar that's horizontal. But if I have bars oriented in other directions, how do I deal with that? Because the idea in finite elements is to be able to have a systematic approach. And so I want to have global deflections that are pointed, um, basically, this is my x coordinate system, this is a y coordinate system. I want everything to be referenced to that coordinate system. I don't want to have a bunch of local coordinate systems. Uh, I want to be able to relate that local coordinate system to the global coordinate system uh, and still be able to solve the problem efficiently. Does that make sense? Yes? OK, great. So what I'm going to do, and don't go, it's easy to get freaked out with math, but if you take your time to, to, to be patient, you'll follow it. OK, that's, that's really the goal here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to attempt to use this for the first time. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Uh, pen on, good. All right, you're not going to see my face for a little while. I don't think this is good, whatever happened. OK. All right, so if I look at a, a, um, a regular element, which is this one here, uh, let's see if this writes. I don't know what that's coming up. OK. This, this methodology is not working for me right now. So that's OK. We'll, we'll continue old school, old school. All right, so, so if I look at the uh, local element behavior, that's a local system, okay? That's a local system. If I, if I look at how much the deflection will be for this node, it's going to move some amount to the right, okay? So that's, that's called as del Jx. What I really wanted to do, I want to represent that in the global coordinate system. How do I do that? Well, that can be represented uh, if I know the angle beta, I can then uh, break up this into two vectors, this one and this one, right? So I can project this del Jx in, into x and to y by using the cosine of, of beta. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. And then now I look at uh, this contribution here, this del Jy. And I, I, again, I can do the same thing. That del Jy is this one here. I can now project that into the x-axis and y-axis, right? And so if I can do that, now 
what I need to do is relate this. Um, so that's a contribution of del gx and del gy. I have to relate this now to the global system. Let's say the global system, the, the, the deflection is gjx and djy. OK, so tell me how I calculate djx then. I just summed the two. So I just add this contribution from del jx, and I add it up to this contribution from del jy. You see that? So that's where the minus sign is coming up here, right? So that's for x. What about for y? Same thing. I take the vertical uh, uh, contributions, del jx sine beta, and added it up to, to this one here, del jy cosine beta. They're additive in this case. Both of them are acting you know, in this direction. So these two can be added together additively, OK? Is that making sense, guys? So that's how I can relate. I can relate the deflection in the local coordinate system, because this is a local coordinate system. This is perpendicular to the bar. That's parallel to the bar. That's how I am relating that to the global deflections, because this was really useful to me, is to know the global deflections for, for the system of interest. OK, does that make sense? OK, let's continue here. I'm going to uh, basically put it in a matrix notation. OK, so can you see the mouse when I move it? OK, so this, this here is what I derived just right now. OK, and so can you see that this can be written in matrix notation this way? Yeah, now I did that for node j. I did that for node j. Uh, I can repeat the same thing for node i, which is here at the bottom, right? Where, again, we're deriving the element formulation uh, that can be used for any element. That's what we're trying to do here. And so, uh, so if I need to repeat it, what I can do, since it's the same thing for i, uh, all you have to do is construct a transformation matrix that connects the deflections on one end, on node i, x and y, and node j, x and y. And you can see here that if I multiply this together with that, I should be able to get DIX, DIY, DJX, and DJY. Do, do you see that with me? I'll give you a couple of seconds to, to kind of look over this so I'm not rushing it. And then ask, ask me if you have questions uh, still. Can you see that when I multiply this times that, I will get this? And I also get the same thing, but for the for the i node, for the for the node, uh, um, the other node. Yes. Any questions? Any questions? No questions. Okay. So now I have related. Now I have related the deflections in the global coordinate system for that element to the local coordinate system through a transformation matrix. Okay. For 10 points extra credit, I want you to show that the inverse of this matrix is equal to the transpose. Okay. Uh, that's usually the case for transformation matrices. But I want you to actually go ahead and show that. Uh, you can use MATLAB, you can use Mathematica, whatever software you want. Or you can do it by hand. More power to you, whatever you want to use. But uh, if you want to get ex ex extra credit, uh, I would like to see that, that calculation. OK, so now I, have a way, now I have a way of relating the local deflections to the global deflections. Okay? And the local deflections are acting how? Somebody tell me. How are these local deflections acting? Sorry, I speak louder. Yeah, very good. So these local deflections are acting along the truss. That's del G X and del I X. Those two are acting along the truss. And then these two are acting perpendicular to the truss. And I am basically converting, transforming this to a global coordinate system. OK? So let's look at what we've done. So right here, del j x and del j y, del j x is acting along, along the truss system. 
and del J1 is acting perpendicular to the truss system. And what we've done is we, we transform that so that it's act, so we have this. So it's in the global coordinate system, the, 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 the letter D there, DJY and DJX. Does that make sense? We can do the same thing uh, with the force. So the local forces, which have small f, I'm using small f for local force of the element, can also be uh, transformed to a global force system. Okay? And if I do that, I can use the same equation. The same equation I just used for deflections, I can use it for, 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 for this, for, for the forces. I can transform, in, transform these guys in the same way. Just like the deflections, these forces, Fix, acts along the truss member. You understand? And Fjx acts here, along the truss uh, 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 axis. Now let's look at the Fiy and Fjy. Any guesses on what that is for, for a bar? If a bar can only take loads along the length of the truss, then perpendicular to the truss, what is it? Zero. So these guys are going to be zero, and you're going to see that in the examples I'll give you. But we need to keep that there because I need to multiply this to my transformation matrix, which then converts it into global uh, force uh, uh, quantity. Uh, sorry, not a global force quantity. It's a local force quantity, but local to the element, but in the global frame, using the global coordinate system, which is X and Y, right? Now, uh, I already asked you for 10 points extra credit to demonstrate that T inverse equals T transpose. And so for that reason, what I can do, uh, if I wanted to, I can take uh, in this equation, you see this D equals T del, right? If I want to invert this, I want to solve for del, what will you do? Pre-multiply by T inverse, what do I get here? Identity matrix. And now I have T inverse times D. What is the inverse? T transpose. So that's what I have uh, uh, I found here. I found that del, I can solve it. It's T transpose times D. Okay? It will become apparent why that's actually powerful. Now, for the force, I can do the same thing. I can solve for force by pre-multiplying T inverse here and T inverse here. And then I find that this identity matrix. And what is T inverse? T transpose again. Okay. Hey, pay attention, guys. You're falling asleep. It's okay. I'm just waking you up. So F, small f equals T transpose times F. And F is in a local coordinate system, and, uh, and this is in a global coordinate system. Okay. But these are local quantities. We're looking at local element behavior. Now, I'm not done yet. I have a lot of work to do still. And, and so if I look at the, um, at a typical uh, 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 bar, trust, we already derived this equation, remember? So these equations should be the equation for this bar. Uh, there's no transverse force, uh, but we know that this should be the relationship. We derived it just a minute ago again. Uh, that should be a relationship for that. But I'm going to trick the system. What I'm going to do, I'm going to add a rows of zeros here and a rows of zeros here, and those correspond to the transverse quantities, the quantities they're not here, because these quantities are along the truss, but I want to get some quantities across or, or transverse, perpendicular to the truss. And to do that, I'm adding rows of zeros. You see what I'm saying? So I'm adding rows of zeros, and as a consequence, I have to add rows of columns of, of zeros. And so if I multiply this times that, I should technically get this back. You agree? Yes? OK, I need to hear yes so I know that you understood it. <laughs> All right, do you understand it? Very good. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to say uh, force. You agree that force equals TF. You agree with that? Yes? OK. So if, if force equals TF, then I can now substitute what F is. Small f equals K, this local stiffness matrix. Okay, which is this one right here, sorry, uh, times del. So that's what this is. So all I did is substitute what small f is. Now, earlier, I don't even remember, but I solved for del earlier in terms of big D, and I got that, remember? Yes? So I'll put that in here. 
And now guess what? Now I got an equation that is local, is local uh, to the element, but it uses global force, global, uh, uh, sorry, global coordinate system to describe that force, and then it uses global coordinate systems to describe that uh, deflection, which it, it, now everything is acting in a global coordinate system, x and y. Does that make sense, what we've done? So now what I've done really is now all I have to do from now on is to calculate this stiffness matrix and then calculate these t's. And I already gave you the formula for t. One of the things I want to teach you in this class is very important for you to trust the system. What I mean with that is that if you follow the steps, that's what matters. Don't even, if, 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 if you ask me, hey, Vinay, do you remember what t is? I'm not going to remember it. But what's important is that you stored it somewhere and you have it written. So I can go back and say, I have t. I calculated t already. This is t. That's t. Okay? So try to pollute your mind with information that's necessary. Because this class, uh, that's what computers are for. They're there to track all these matrices. And, and that's what finite, finite elements is about. Finite elements is about coming up with an approach so that the computer can take care of it. So don't feel like you have to know, uh, um, you have to know the steps on how we derived it because that's what this class is about. But what I want to make sure is that you are not uh, uh, stressing yourself out, okay? Because the, if you stress yourself out, you will not learn, okay? So that's what's important right here for you to understand, that we come up with the, stiff, with, with the element formulation uh, that works uh, by referring the quantities to a global coordinate system. Because that's what trusses have orientations that are not straight. They're, they're, they're different orientations. So that's, let's move on here and look at what that calculation looks like. I already gave you what t is earlier. I know what k prime is, is this here. And then I have t transpose. If I multiply all that out, this is what you're going to get. Uh, you can get a, a symmetric stiffness matrix. It's not a surprise. Uh, you get a, a symmetric stiffness matrix. Uh, that when you see C there, that's cosine beta, and then when you see S, it's sine beta. Okay? What's important for you to also remember is how that beta is measured. Beta, beta, in the way we've defined it, starts from the x-axis measured from here, this x-axis moving um, counterclockwise. Okay? So that's what's important for you to, to kind of keep in mind. That's important because when you develop an element formulation, you have to keep track of how you develop the element, okay? You cannot arbitrarily make up a convention and then switch a letter. You have to keep track of that. Um, so now I know how to calculate the stiffness matrix. And the question is, hey, how do I apply this? Well, that's, that's what we have examples for, is, is to go through that process. Um, the, the same process for assembly, uh, we were, sorry, we already have the element formulation here. Uh, everything is in global. Isn't that nice? Everything is global coordinate system. Uh, and I have the local element formulation. I have the stiffness matrix. And now I will have, for every element, I will have four code numbers now that I have to track, not two like before. Okay, so you have to keep track of that. Um, uh, in this example, sorry. So, so the summary of this uh, example is basically we discretize the body, we develop the local element behavior, okay, and then we'll use code numbers to assemble things together. And I'll give an example. Hopefully that example will be of help. Um, so example number one. Example number one has a truss system as described on the left-hand side. And you can see here that you have a truss here, truss here, truss there. This one is pinned, and this one is uh, a roller. Okay, so, so it's kind of free to, to move vertically. Then I apply a load uh, of 45 degrees, P naught. Okay, so if I look at this problem, I can discretize the domain, and I'll discretize into three elements. Uh, and I'll assign uh, element number one to be this guy, element number two to be this guy, element number three to be that guy. The second step, I want to define what beta is for that truss. Because remember, beta, how does beta become important? How? I'm going to need it, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it, for beta is needed to relate local to global, 
uh, and it's part of the formula that I showed you earlier here. So that, that's required here in this formula, cosine of beta, sine of beta. And so for element number one, do you agree that beta is zero? If I measure, that's the origin for that element. Let's look at element number two. For element number two, I have two options. I have two options for element number two. For element number two, I can go from this node down or from this node down, okay? I arbitrarily chose that that node starts from top to bottom. That's fine, I can do that. But when I calculate beta, I have to be careful. So the beta should be calculated against the x-axis along, and I'm going from left to right. That's how I decided for this example problem. And so what is that angle? Now it's minus 45 degrees. And you know it's minus 40, you know that angle because you know uh, that this is L and this is L, so you know the angles. That's geometry. Okay, that's geometry. Uh, and then for element three, for element three, I'm going from, I chose it arbitrarily. You can go from top to bottom or bottom to top, but I'm, I went from bottom to top, so I to J, so I to J, and then I calculate against the I, or uh, the I is your origin. So then what is that angle? 90 degrees. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, so, so as an example for element two, all I have to do is plug it into my K formula for k. That's all I have to do. Okay. Let's look at the code number. Code numbers. Is this constrained, right? Fully constrained. And then this one is a pinned, uh, but sorry, is, is a roller. Uh, and this one is free. So how many degrees of freedom do I have? Let's think about it. How, how many degrees of freedom I have? Three. What are the what are the three degrees of freedom that we have here? This can, this can move to the right, and this can move up. That's D1 and D2. And then this guy can move up or down, so that's D3. So, that's, so the, my stiffness matrix at the end has to be what? Of what size? Three by three. And I should be able to solve for D1, D2, and D3 with the applied loads that I have. So let's look at the code number. The code number, uh, which I, I gave it here, but let's say you don't, I'm not showing you that, and you, just pretend you're looking here, okay? Just focus here. Uh, what is the code number for element one? So this direction is fixed, so that's zero. This direction is fixed, that's zero. So the first two numbers for code number for element one is zero, zero. And then for element two, so for element one, no two, what do I have? One and two. So for element one, I have zero, zero, one, two. For element two, how did I decide to go about that one? From right to top or top to, 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 to bottom? Which way did I decide? Top to bottom, right? So that, for that reason, I have to start here. So what is the code number for this direction? Zero. What is the code number for that direction? Three. So I should have zero and three, hopefully, and I have that. And then for this guy, going to the right is one, and going up is two. So I have one and two. And then finally, for element number three, I think I'm boring you to death at this point, but we can still do it. Uh, how did I decide to go? Bottom to top or top to bottom? So. I went from bottom to top, so then this is fixed in this direction, that direction is zero and zero, code number zero and zero, and this one is zero and three. So then I have zero, 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 and three. Any questions on this? Any questions on this? This is a moment to ask because I will have another example. What did you say the order of one, two, and three? Uh, repeat your question again. How do I decide one, so two, and three? Two, if you're going horizontal, it's one. If you're going vertical, it's two. So you can arbitrarily number everything as you want. The important thing is that when you define the element connectivity, you're consistent. I could have numbered it. I could have numbered it uh, one, two, and three. But the important thing is at the end of the day, you have control. You have to make sure that you're consistent. Okay. And I'll have another example with more trust elements. Trust me. We, we can look at that. Trust elements, trust me. That, that rhymes. OK, so let's, uh, let's look at uh, the, the, the stiffness matrix. I don't want to bore you to death, but you can calculate the stiffness matrix for each of these guys. And I mean 1, 2, and 3. Write the code numbers here. 
bam, here, bam, here, bam. Now, assemble it. We said it would be a three by three, so one, two, and three, one, two, and three. Search for one. Where does one, one happen? So I look here. I do a search algorithm, and I look at where one, one happens. Where, where does one, one happen here? It's that one right there. And then here shows up here. And then here, I have nothing. So those two will get added, and that's what you see there. I'm not going to bore you, but the rest of them can be quickly added up. Okay? And you can write a, a, a subroutine, basically, that will automate this process. Okay? Does this, you want me to do another example of this, or you follow it, how I assembled it? Raise your hand if you want me to do another quick, quick one. Okay. You want me to try one? Okay. Which one do you want me to try from here? So you want me to do two and two or two and one? Let's do two and one, something different. So two and one. I'll go here. Where do you see two and one? Position two and one. So position two and one is that guy, right? Do I see two and one here? So I search. I have a two and I have a one there. So that one has to be added up to that guy. Here, do I see a two? No. And I don't see a one. So I'm done. Those two need to be added. And that's what you see that are written here. Does that make sense? OK. So I have assembled my stiff the stiffness matrix. Let's look at the load vector, the force vector. The force vector, am I applying? Let's go back to the original problem so you can see. Uh, in the original problem, in this direction, I'm applying p squared, squared of 2 over 2. In this direction, I'm applying p squared of 2 over 2. In this direction, I'm applying any force. I'm applying any force there. No. So it's zero, right? So then what I have now is my force vector. OK? And so now all I have to do, well, I didn't do it, but k, this, this matrix, are, all these numbers are known. You agree? I have the deflection vector. That needs to be solved for d1, d2, and d3. And equals the force. I invert the stiffness matrix, and I'll get d1, d2, and d3. I'll get the deflections. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions so far on this? Here, there's no reason. Uh, you, you're not assembling the force because, remember, we talked about applying concentrated forces. Uh, and so because of that reason, we're applying um, concentrating forces uh, at this level, right? So at this level. The, the forces are not applied at the local element level. They're applied in the global element, in the global system, right? Now when, remember, there is a, a, a difference here. In the homework problem number one, there's a distributed force. I want you to go back to lecture one, and I show you there how to deal with distributed forces. Those need to be tracked at the element level. And those need to be assembled. So, so let's look at that again, if, if, if possible, OK? All right, you're going to need it for problem number one, all right? Uh, so let's look at uh, another example I think is useful. I actually solved this in Abacus as well. And I'll show you how I did it. Um, this one um, is also in the book. Uh, so so you, have, uh, you can read it there also if you want to. Uh, but here I have the cantilever truss structure is fixed here, fixed here, and that's the truss system. All the dimensions are given. The area is given here. The length of each bar is given here. And then you apply a load on the right-hand side in the middle here. Uh, and, and so with this information, you should be able to now, uh, basically, it's a great example, actually. Uh, I mean, isn't it? Uh, it? It gives you all the information you need to, to actually execute. So. In this problem, what I'm looking for is deflections, right? In real life, am I, am I just looking for deflections? Huh? I want to know when the structure fails, whether it's safe or not. Deflection also can be a, a, an important consideration, uh, but force, you need to also look at w whether the structure fails. So, so that's the angle in, in the problems I gave you. In both of them, I'm asking you to calculate the stresses as well and compare them. Compare them to the allowable, allowable of the material. So um, moving on here, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, well, I'm showing you too much at once. But 
where, where do I have it fixed? Here and here. So what code numbers will, will I assign here? Zero this way, zero that way. Zero this way, zero that way. So uh, in the next line, uh, what I show you is the element number, the way I've described it, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then the other thing I've done, I put the code numbers here, zero, 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 zero. For this no node, I'm making it one and two. But I could have made this one one and two. I just, uh, Arian, to answer your question, I just chose this way, OK? Which makes it really hard for my, for uh, we don't have a grader yet. I hope we get one. But it makes it hard for us to grade, right? There is a reason why I'm asking you to compare to Abacus, right? It better be right. It needs to compare right, and it needs to compare to Abacus really well, OK? Uh, three and four, and then we'll make this five and six. So how many degrees of freedom do you see here? Six. Six degrees of freedom. It's kind of painful, right? Because you have to invert that. And I don't want anybody here to invert it by hand. You, know, you want to use MATLAB in, in that situation. Uh, or Excel actually can invert things. Um, uh, surprisingly, I didn't know he could do it. Um, so for member one, for member one, what is the code number? Don't look at the, solu the solution is there, but, but, but focus on here. What is the code number? I start with node i, and that's node j. So the code number is 0, 0. 1, 2. And that's what you see there, 0, 0, 1, 2. Uh, and I chose this direction. You see these arrows? That's how I chose to start the element, from i to j, i to j, i to j, i to j. I'm choosing that direction. Okay? You can choose any direction you want, but then when you calculate beta, you have to be consistent. Okay? Beta is measured from i to j, the line that joins from i to j to the x-axis. That's how you measure beta. Okay, so let's let's do another one. Uh, element six goes from i to j here, so that's three, four, five, six. So that you have for element six, three, four, five, six. Okay. Any anybody wants me to do another example? Well, you follow it. We're good. I like when you guys do this. This means I can go on. All right. Uh, that's great. So now I have a load applied here. I load up like they're great. Um, all right, all right. Let's let's just keep moving on here. Uh, it was, it's going to get boring from now on because it's really easy. <laughs> member one, member one. So if I is here and J is here, how much is beta? Zero. So beta is zero. Uh, e A over L is easy. The 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 modulus of aluminum is ten times ten to the E six. Uh, but you see 10 to the E3 because we're doing everything in uh, kips. So, so it's like in terms of a thousands, okay? Um, <clears throat> area is given for each trust member, so you have that information. The length is given. Now, it's a trick problem because the length is given in feet, 12 feet, right? So I have to convert that into inches. So one thing I want to point out, I see a lot of errors being made in industry. And so you will see discrepancies. Some, you know, you have to convert er everything to be in the same unit, okay? And I'll trick you in a homework and midterm exam because I want you to learn it. I want to make sure that you are aware. You're not just trying to mechanically solve something. I, I, you need to use your head and try to understand what you're doing, okay? And so from that perspective, uh, we get uh, K, the, the K, uh, in. Uh, if I substitute in my formula, in the formula that I had there earlier, uh, where's the formula? This formula here, uh, cosine of beta, sine beta, you put all this in, uh, you will get uh, for beta equals zero, uh, th that to be the stiffness matrix, okay? For that element, just for that element. Um, and it's a good idea also to write the code numbers in here so that we had said that 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, 2, so that's what that is. Uh, for element two, uh, element two goes uh, from here to here, right? Yes. And so, how should beta be measured then? Beta should be measured in between the x-axis, right, and that. Because we said this element goes from i to j that way. So beta is 143 if you calculated it using geometry. Um, again. The, the stiffness uh, value K2 can be 
calculate it, and you can quickly calculate this stiffness matrix. It's not, it's not difficult to do. I gave you the formula already. You can just use the formula, OK? Uh, element 3, the same thing. I'm not going to bore you to death. 4, 5, 6, <laughs> OK? You can calculate all these things together. Then, what is the next step? What is the next step? I've calculated the stiffness matrices for every single element. What is the next step? Assembly. Assembly. Very well. So, assembly stiffness matrix. That's my next step. And uh, I try to do it nicely here. Uh, and you can go home and verify. Okay. But these are the code numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, if you want to know how I did it, it's very easy. Give me a number that you want me to go and search out. Give me a location here. Which one you want me to do? Arian, give me a, a location. Two and five. What? Two and five. Two and five. I, um, is that a good one? Yeah. Two and five is great. <laughs> it probably doesn't have anything. Good choice. Uh, let's see if we have two and five here. Do you see a two and five here? No? Two and five there? Yes, actually. And is, is, is what? Zero. That, that location here. Two and five, that's zero. Um, two and five here? No. Two and five here? No. No. So you, you made a great choice. Um, anybody wants to try a different one? Uh, you, you, I mean, you can, you can, you can look, uh, you can do three and four, you will get the same answer. I just mean like, so, all right, so for three and four, for that example, could we go back to one that has three and four? Yeah, so the question for the video, yeah. it, the question is, is there any reason I chose uh, a row or column first and then a row? Uh, and the answer to the question is, uh, as long as you get the position correctly, it doesn't matter. So. The position I'm looking for is 3 and 4, as an example. And I'm going to search for that in the previous uh, here. So I have 3 and 4. So that's that number. Uh, it, it, and, and in fact, uh, it's symmetric, so it, it won't matter either. But uh, that's why you see here I only wrote half of this, because it's symmetric. Okay. Um, hopefully, I didn't make a, a mistake. I don't think I did, because 3 and 4 here, although you don't see that it matches what I had written, uh, you have to multiply that by this number, and then you will get what I have there. Well, and it's not what I have there. It's actually an example from the book. Okay, uh, I'll give credit where credit is due. All right. Um, now all you have to do now is assemble the uh, load vector. The next step is to assemble the load vector. And uh, do I have? That? Let's look at the loading that we have here in this example problem. Uh, looking at this, looking at this problem, what are the loads applied? I'm only applying a load here and here, and it goes with code number 6 and 2, locations 2 and 6, and they're actually uh, acting opposite, so in a negative direction. Okay, And so if I go here, that's what I did. In positions 2, I put minus 9. In position 6, I put minus 6. Now I have my stiffness matrix. I have the deflection matrix. Sorry, stiffness matrix, load, mat uh, load vector. What do I need to do now? Invert K and solve for the deflections. And I did that here um, in this, uh, you know, in this uh, um, picture here. And when you solve for deflections, you get these numbers right here at the bottom. That's what you get. OK, any questions on that? Any questions on that? Moving on here, uh, let's say, OK, <laughs> so now, uh, are you done by just getting deflections? Are you done? But, I mean, we can go home because we calculated deflections. What else do I need to do? I want to know, in addition to knowing deflections, which is great to know, I want to know when the structure fails. Right? So then I need to calculate the forces in each member. Okay? To do that, I know the deflections. I know them. So what I'll do, I'll go to the local elements and calculate that information. So 
So if I look here, remember, guys, that the local force uh, was described as small f. Remember that? The local force. Right? So, so let me go back and, and remind you that a little bit. So if I go to the diagram here, the big F was a global direction, the force in the global direction. I'm going to look at small f, which is, you see, the small f corresponds to the local direction. You see that? That's the one I'm interested in, because I'm interested in the force along the truss. And so we came up with the equation, I don't know if you recall, but we came up with the relationship of global force to, sorry, not global force, but uh, forces in a local element in the global coordinate system, and then forces in the local element in the local coordinate system. We have a relationship there. So let's use that relationship uh, to try to calculate the local forces in the, in the system that I care about. Um, I don't know where it went. Oh, here it is. So small f equals the transpose of, of the transformation matrix times f, big F, and then big F is k times d. I know this, right? And so t, the transformation matrix is known, uh, and all I have to do now is calculate that for every single element. So let's look at how I did that there. Uh, I know the transformation matrix for, for element number one. I know k. I know the deflections. I calculated these numbers already. I got this earlier. I, I got, so this was 0, 0, and then column numbers 1 and 2, d1, d2. This was the value for d1. That was the value for d2. So if I multiply all these things together, guess, guess what I got? Look at the numbers I got. The force is 28 along here. And then zero, transverse. That makes sense. That's what, what, what I told you that we should be able to get before. Because that's an assumption in this theory. So that's a great check, actually. If you don't get zeros, then you have a problem. The question is, is the membrane, the, the me member intention or compression? So you can draw it, because we say Fix is 28. OK, so that stays the same direction. Fjx is minus 28. So we need to reverse that. So how is it acting? In compression. So that's how you know it's in compression or tension. Um, let's do one more example, uh, because I don't, don't want to bore you to death. Uh, it's the same formula over and over for every single member. Um, for another member, uh, uh, we calculate the transformation matrix. We multiply by the stiffness matrix for that element in the global coordinate system times the deflections uh, and in this case, what do I have for element 2? For element 2, I'm here. And that's 1 and 2, 0 and 0. So I have the deflection d1, the deflection d2, and I have 0, and I have 0. And if I multiply all this together, guess what I get? I get 0 transverse of the trust. That's right. It should be 0. That's what we talked about. Uh, because these members only carry load along the trust. And finally, I have minus 25 and 25. If I plot that here, minus 25 means I have to reverse the sign the, or the, or the, or the uh, orientation of that vector. And then 25 is acting that way. That's the, so that means intention. And then I can repeat this process for every single member. And I've, we've done that here for every single member. Okay. Now. Um, to get the reaction forces, if I, if I ask you to get the reaction forces here and here, uh, the, the approach to do that, uh, one approach, there's many different ways to do it, but the one approach that you could use is that you're going to take, um, you're going to actually, um, basically, uh, remember I put here 0 and 0, 0 and 0, remember that? So let's just number those out, 7 and 8, 9 and 10, let's just finish it up. Okay, and then you'll assemble the full stiffness matrix with seven and eight, nine and ten included. Okay, and then when you multiply that by the deflection vector, okay, because these are all zeros, right? These these d seven, d eight, d nine, d ten, the ones that go here, are zero. The values are zero. I know these ones, d one through d six. I know them from from I just calculated them earlier. Uh, 
just multiply these by that, and not only you can check that you should get 0 minus 9, 0, 0, 0 minus 6, but you will get these reaction forces coming out automatically by this multiplication. Okay? Any questions on that? Because you're going you're to do this in the homework. I, I'm going to try not to be excessive. I don't want you to have a 10 by 10. I mean, I'm going to try to find, maybe we'll create a problem that's a little bit more doable, okay? Uh, but I think at the end you may need MATLAB or something to invert the matrix. You still need, need to do that. And if you do have questions on how to do that, uh, I, you can email me or email him, Leonardo and we can show you how to do the command in, in, in MATLAB. Uh, but I do recommend uh, to get used to not having help because in industry, you're kind of on your own. So you, you can ask help from colleagues, but there's something also called help manual. Okay. You can go to the help manual, and nowadays with YouTube, people show all kinds of things. So you can also learn there too, as well. That does not mean that we're not approachable. We'll help you if you ask for help, okay? All right, so how do I do this in Abacus? How do I implement this in Abacus? So in Abacus, what I've done, uh, and I'm not following uh, that same numbering that I had over there in, 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 the, in the example problem. But I'm solving the exact same problem. And so uh, here, I've numbered the elements. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so I've numbered them differently, I think. I, I don't think it's the same way. And then I have the non-numbers I'm numbering. One, two, uh, three, four, and five. That's how I did it. So, um, so what is the first step? Uh, close your eyes. Don't look. <laughs> well, no, you don't have to close your eyes. But I define the nodes. That's the first step. And so what I've done here is I, I put the node. Uh, how many nodes do I have there? Five. I have five nodes. Uh, so I put one, two, three, four, five, and I put the positions of each node, x and y. Very simple. This actually took me literally. Uh, and I'm not, not trying to show off. It took, took me three minutes to put together. And it ran right the first time. And I think you guys can also accomplish that. All of you can do it really quick. It won't take long, as long as you learn the format. Um, now, for element number one, element number one, what is the connectivity? What nodes are connected to element one? One, two. So that's what I wrote there. Element one is one, two. Let's choose element four. Element four, without looking, element four is connected by what nodes? Two, five. And so element four. I put 5, 2, but that's, that's fine. It's going to work. Uh, and so forth. OK, you can check the other ones. I did that. So what is that 5, 2, 3? So, 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 so thank you for an, uh, asking that question. The question for the video is, what is type? And I, f I forgot to mention what type is. But in Abacus, um, there's an element library. And the element library gives you uh, choices for what kinds of elements you can use. And the element that I'm using here is a trust element. Abacus actually has a trust element. And since this, this is a 2D problem, what I've chosen to do is use T2D. So this T means trust, 2D means two-dimensional, and this two means it has two nodes. Uh, but Abacus in a manual actually explains this to you also. In fact, in fact, just to, just to be fair, I actually did not remember what element type I had to use because it's been a long time. So I actually went to the Abacus manual, clicked on element types. There's trust elements. So I clicked on trust elements, and then it told me what kind of trust elements exist. And I said, well, I want to replicate uh, what's in this example problem. And I found that this is the one I want to use that will get me closer to the example problem. And so what I've done here, I, you can see here, you can normally, if everything was the same cross-section, same modulus, um, then you don't need to have everything in a different element set. You can have everything uh, lined up back to back. Okay? But because everything, every single truss has a different cross-sectional area, I had to put them in different element sets. Okay? That becomes important because I had to define that in, in here, in this section here. This section here defines the properties. Kind of like with the springs, remember? I define the nodes, the elements, and then I define the properties of that spring. Remember that? Yes? So for trusses, similarly, I define the nodes, the elements, and the properties of that truss. 
So for element one, solid section just means that I'm going to define the properties of that section. And if you look in the abacus manual, it tells you that for a truss, what you need to define here is the area, the cross-section area. It tells you what to define. Okay? For this particular problem, the cross-section cross area is 5.6 inch squared for element one. Uh, for elements is 1.25, 0 0.4, 1 1.2, 1.6. And all, each of these is mapped to the appropriate element here. Okay, so the areas are, are mapped. Now I reference it also to the material. Because in the, in the property sections, you have to also tell it what material you're going to be using. This is a made up num uh, name. You know, I could, I could put Leonardo. Material equals Leonardo, right? I can do that. But I put aluminum, AL, that's a short short uh, cut for aluminum. And, um, and then here, I now define the material for that aluminum. So it's material, comma, name equals aluminum, star elastic. And under star elastic, I put the modulus and the Poisson ratio. The modulus of, of, of aluminum is 10 E6, and then the Poisson ratio is 0.33. And then now I again uh, start the se solution sequence uh, step static, it's not, it's not a dynamic problem, so it's static. Boundary condition, so I'll apply the boundary condition now. What is the boundary condition? For, for node 1 and 4 is fixed. You agree? So for 1 and 4 is fixed, so degrees of freedom 1 through 6, 1 through 6, I'm making them 0. This is fixed. Those nodes are fixed. All degrees of freedom are fixed for those nodes. Uh, so, so I did it, um, uh, in reality it's a 2D problem, and, and you don't have to do that, but um, the degrees of freedom in Abacus run 1 through 6. 1 through 3 are translations, okay, and 4 through 6 are rotations. And so, although trust elements don't have rotations, I, I just fixed them. It's fixed anyway, right? So, but theoretically, all I had to do is maybe fix 1 through 2, and then 1 through 2. That's all I had to do. Uh, what are those applied? Uh, yeah, the boundary. So, so just very easy. So the first number, the first column here is a node. The second one and the third one tells you the degrees of freedom that need to be fixed. So for, if I look at the boundary condition for this problem, what is fixed? W node 1 and node 4, right? For node 1, degrees of freedom 1 through 6 is fixed to zero. And then for node four, degrees of freedom one through six is fixed to zero. Does that make sense? Now I apply the external loads. C load, concentrated load. Where is the concentrated load applied? We talked about here, remember? We talked about applying it here and then here. In the original example problem, if you go back, oh, it's actually here. You can see there. It was nine pounds downwards, six point six pound uh, keep, keeps downwards in these two nodes. So let's go back to the, uh, to the problem. Uh, and I applied in node 2, right? Does that go in node 2? Right? So node 2, so node 2, degree of freedom 2. The, 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 the force is acting in the vertical direction, and, and that's degree of freedom 2 for that node. So that's 2, 2, and how many pounds? Minus 9,000 pounds. And then for degree of freedom, for node 3, I have 6,000 pounds downwards, so I have node 3, comma 2, uh, two because degree of freedom 2, right? Minus 6,000 pounds, submit into Abacus. Abacus solves it within like 0 0.01 seconds. I'm not kidding. <laughs> all that effort I put, right? All these charts I was showing you, and then Abacus just, bam, does it, right? Well, then, what is the next step, guys? What if this thing was deforming upwards? The whole thing was going up. What would you say? There was, there was an error. There's a problem. Because I applied the load going downwards, I expect the whole thing to move downwards, right? So it's very important for you to check that things make sense, that, that things are really making sense. And also you can check um, other things, like the deflection should be the highest here, that makes sense. Um, uh, anyway, you can check various things. You can actually check that the deflection is zero and zero here, right? Well, what I did, I, I, I use something in Abacus called probe values. I can probe the value at different locations. And what I did here, you can see, I probed the values at nodes 2 
3 and 5. So 2, 3, and 5. And I found the deflections there. So it tells me the deflection in the 1 direction and the 2 direction. So these are the numbers I'm getting, right? Now, if you compare this to what I got, it was exact match. Like, I, I'm not kidding. It's like 0 0.288, 0 0.288. Right? So it, it's like perfect. Okay? And I was actually kind of concerned because I was putting this really quick together. And I'm like, if this doesn't work, I'm going to have to find the error, and this will suck. And it worked out. And I was like, yes, I'm done. <laughs> I don't have to ask Leonardo to, to find the problem. <laughs> okay. All right, so there you go. No, actually, it will not have been Leonardo. It will have been you. I'll have asked you to find the problem. All right, so with that said, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you th a three to five minutes break. Actually, no, let's make it uh, consistent here. So everybody, everybody has cell phone here. So be back by 520. I'm giving you four minutes to do whatever you need to do. All right?
Okay. Um, now that you're back, I'm going to offer you an opportunity to, to make extra points as well. And, and one opportunity that you have here in this class is that you'll have the opportunity to program uh, to, uh, uh, and, and you'll get uh, points for submitting a program that actually does what Abacus just did. So if you de develop a input file just like this one and, and, and you write a program that takes this information and gets all, all the deflections, gets all the forces automatically, um, uh, then you'll get extra points if you submit that. It needs to be uh, well, you know, explained. The code needs to be well explained. Uh, you should have a cover page for the report uh, with explanations of how you went about it. Uh, throughout, the, throughout the course, I'm going to offer these opportunities for various problems. Uh, for, for the trust system, I'm offering the opportunity because it's, it's a great way to start learning how to code stuff up. Um, I give you some resources in my book on how to code these things uh, with pseudo algorithms. And in the, in the appendix, I actually have MATLAB uh, examples on, on things like that. I will not be able to have time to teach what's in the appendix. Uh, but uh, you know, I give you this opportunity because I think you're, you guys are smart and you can do it. Uh, uh, many people in the past uh, uh, take upon this opportunity. Uh, when we approach the final, I'll also, uh, no, actually, by next week, I'll give you another opportunity that if this final report is, is so good, I may be able to say, hasta la vista. You don't need to do the final exam. So, so it depends. I, I'll offer that opportunity. That opportunity, only few will select because it's, it's, it's not easy to, 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 to do. And I showed you a report from previous years. But uh, I, I do ask that if you're going to work on this code, you work independently. Do not copy so other people's work. You can corroborate. Now, m my recommendation to you, collaboration means talking, trying to figure things out. But don't look at other people's code, because at that moment in time, you'll be tempted to do little more than just uh, uh, looking at the code. Just, just talk to each other. Um, in terms of the help that Leonardo can I and I can provide for these codes, it may be a little bit limited because we're going to be focusing on, on what this class requires. But don't feel bad to ask me after class, like, if, you know, how I go about this, and, and maybe I can give you some clues. Uh, but generally speaking, it's pretty logical how to code these things up. As you saw, is the stiffness matrix the same for every single one of these elements, basically? The formula is the same. It's the, same. the formula is the same for every single element. And to assemble it, as you can see, there's logic that goes along with that. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard to assemble it either. So um, I offer the opportunity for those that want to take it. OK? Yes? No, the code has to work for any problem. Well, you know, I don't, I'm not going to make your code work for 10 million degrees of freedom. Uh, it should at least work for 100, right? It should work for, 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 for a large number of elements. And no, I want to make sure it works, right? And not only that, you have to show that it works. So you have to run some examples with your code, and then you have to compare it with what, what you will get with Abacus. So the code needs to graph the things or just? Uh, you can create, uh, prepare tables with, with uh, comparing Abacus to what, whatever you think is necessary to validate your code. Deflections, forces, yeah? But I, I do want to warn you. I don't want you to put this as the highest priority. The highest priority is to finish the homework first. Do that. Do the, uh, uh, um, the CAE part of it. And if then you have extra time, because you have so much free time, <laughs> code it up. And I recommend it. When I took the course, I did it. And for me, it was not extra credit. It was required. And I learned a lot by doing it. Okay, So, so I do recommend it. Um, but I also know in a quarter system, it's pretty tight. When I did it, it was a semester system, so I had more time. So for that reason, I'm making it optional, but strongly recommended. If you're going to pursue finite elements, 
as an area of expertise, strongly recommended. Okay? But with great reward, you get points, extra points. Okay, great. Um, with that said, I'm going to move. Go, go ahead, you have a question? Sorry, where do you want it done by? Uh, I'm going to leave it a little open. So you have, you know, two to three weeks to go about it. But uh, the faster you do it, the more you can do. Because as I move forward every week, I'll give you new opportunities, right? And so if you want to take advantage of every opportunity, you should start now. I mean, after you do the homework, and if you have the extra time, I recommend that pursue the opportunity, do it as quick as you can, so that when I give you the next opportunity, you can try that one. Uh, but I don't expect giving the next opportunity maybe in another two or three weeks. Okay? Great. Uh, there's no strict deadline. It's more at your own pace. Okay? Otherwise, if I give you a deadline, um, there's no motivation, right? The whole point that I have is I want you to pursue the opportunity. Okay? Uh, but I also don't want you to give me a trust code at the very end of the quarter. Either. I mean, let's be reasonable here, okay? All right. Let's be reasonable. All right, so moving on here, I want to give an example of a situation that you could encounter in real life. And uh, a, a situation is where this node, for example, uh, can only slide on a slanted surface, okay? With an, a slanted surface along that's measured an angle alpha along the x-axis. So, so this, this is a rotor, uh, and uh, now I'm going to ask you a trick question. This is a trick question, a good exam question, too. If I have made it fixed, do I need to worry about what I'm going to explain you next? If I'm drawing a triangle, rotate it like that, and I make it totally fixed, do I care about what I'm going to say next? No, because it's fixed. So the deflection this way is zero, the deflection is that way is zero. Okay. What makes this problem a little bit challenging is that all my loadings and, 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 and deflections were converted into a global coordinate system. However, this rotor uh, it, it makes it difficult because it is an inclined surface, and, and now I have to somehow approach it, right? Because everything is a global coordinate system. Um, the deflections are, the forces are, but yet the constraints I want to impose are easily imposed in a local coordinate system. So here you can see that. It would be easier if the coordinate system was this way, like perpendicular to this surface and along, because that way I can say, okay, perpendicular is zero and along is free to go, right? I can do that right now easily in a global coordinate system. And for that reason, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, use the following strategy. We're going to take that node, that particular node, and I'm going to actually remember when it was fixed, I'll typically put 0, 0, right? Like here, 0, 0, and 0, 0. What I'm going to do this time around is a little bit different. I'm going to say, you know, it's, a, it's an inclined surface. Um, there's actually additional constraints in some way because I have an inclined surface, and that node can only slide along, right? And for that reason, I'm going to make it into degrees of freedom that are available, 5 and 6. I'm going to make it 5 and 6, although I know for a fact that that node does have a constraint. Okay? But I'm going to make it available uh, free. Okay? And, and um, so I'm going to proceed the same way as I did before, assemble the whole thing with code numbers. And I'm not going to repeat this because it's the same approach. Um, but what I'll do. And this is where the tricks come, and, and I hope you can follow me. And if you don't, please ask me questions now. What I'll do, I'll transform. I'll transform 5 and 6 locally so that 5 prime is aligned with the slanted surface, and 6 is perpendicular to the slanted surface. I'm going to do that. And if I write how d5 and d6 relate to d5 prime and d6 prime, uh, I will use uh, this equation, and you can check it at home that this actually works out. So for 10 points extra credit, I want you to demonstrate that this is true, that this is a true thing, that this is going to work out, that that formula transformation matrix, in fact, can rotate d5, d6 into d5 prime and d6 prime. And, and that's not very difficult to do because I already did it earlier uh, in class, right? Uh, that's one of the things I did earlier in class. Um, 
Similarly, similarly the forces, the global forces, <coughs> can be rotated as well. So I have Q5 and Q6. I can rotate into Q5 prime and Q6 prime using the same transformation matrix. So I can use the same approach. Uh, and I'm going to call this transformation matrix TA. You can call it whatever you want. I'm just calling it TA for the purposes of this class. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do, and please, when you see a lot of matrices like that, don't, don't freak out. Let me guide you, and then you can freak out if you don't follow. Okay? Uh, in the equation at the top, that's the assembled stiffness matrix with the D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, like before. I mean, basically, the same thing as you had before. Uh, and the lows are 0, minus 9, 0, 0. Now, Q5 and Q6, you don't know what to do with them. So leave them like that for now, right? Because Q5 and Q6 are related to the situation uh, here. I mean, that's Q5 and Q6. And I don't know how to quite address that right now. And I don't know how to quite address D5 and D6 either. For that reason, I'm going to take this, uh, and I'm going to think about how, what can I do. What I can do is to somehow make this D5 prime and D6 prime. That's what I can do. And make this Q5 prime and Q6 prime. If I, if I can make that happen, then I know how to impose the boundary conditions. Then I know how to apply the global forces. So to accomplish that, I'm going to transform this vector, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, into uh, D1, D2, D3, D4, but with prime on D5 and D6 prime. And the only thing that will be affected is this guy here. Right? D d can you see that everything works out? If I multiply this transformation matrix times that, I should be able to get the one on the left-hand side. So all I have done, all I have done, I have augmented, and that's the word that we should be using, we've augmented uh, this matrix into including the other degrees of freedom. So, so you can have them all there, OK? I can do the same thing with the forces. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, and Q6. Q5 and Q6 are the ones that are uh, uh, the ones I'm interested in having in the, in the local coordinate system that is along the slanted surface. That's really what I want, OK? Any questions on this? I'm going to give you like a minute. To, to kind of uh, uh, digest a little bit. And then please raise your hand if you have a question. Because you, you will have a homework problem on this. Okay, no questions so far. So, so to assemble, you'll assemble it like normal, just like normal. And all we're doing here is trying to figure out what to do with these guys. And we're going to tackle it by transforming it so that these two guys, uh, D5 prime and D6 prime, is in local coordinate system so that it's along the slanted surface and perpendicular to the slanted surface. Same thing with the forces, Q5 and Q6, Q5 prime and Q6 prime. Okay, I'll call this... Uh, uh, this variable here, okay, and I'm going to use that. So moving here, uh, you can see here that, oh, sorry, you can see here that, um, let me call this D prime, let me call this vector D prime, I'll call this um, that symbol, <laughs> and then we call this D, okay, we'll call this Q prime, and then lambda, right, I believe, and then you have this Q. So then, I have this. I have d prime equals uh, lambda d, q prime lambda q. Okay. Uh, and my goal, my real goal, is to somehow put things in terms of d prime and q prime. If you see here, my, my stiffness matrix I've assembled is k with the d's, and this d's is not the way I wanted it. And the q, that q, I need that in, in so it follows that that slanted surface. And so to do that. You can quickly see, I can, I can calculate D very easily. I know D in terms of D prime because all I have to do is invert this. If I invert this, then I can get D. Now, the inverse of a transformation matrix is what? 
the transpose. So all I have to do is to transpose this to get transpose times d prime. I'm solving for d basically from that equation on the left, and then and then this is equal to q, right? Okay, now if I pre-multiply everything, this is a trick. If I pre-multiply everything by lambda here, then I get lambda in this side, I get lambda in this side, and guess what happens? Lambda times q is q prime. So I get q prime right there, and I'm done. Now I have, now I have been able to relate everything so that, and I'll show you in the next line, I'll show you in the next line. Uh, by using this technique, I'm now able to have d phi prime here, d6 prime, and for the q prime now I have, now I can impose the boundary conditions. You can see. So for d phi prime, what's happening? It's free to move, right? So is it un unknown or known? Along d phi prime. It's unknown, I don't know. Uh, along d6 prime, what is it? It's fixed. So I put a zero here, right? And then q5, because d5 prime is free to move on this direction, what is a load? There's no load that is being applied there, so that's zero. You can see how nice this is now, because I've transformed it. And, and you have to perform this operation, this lambda transpose times the stiffest matrix times this lambda. You have to perform that, of course. But after you're done performing that multiplication, everything becomes really easy now. Because what is the, how many, how many, the only ones I don't know now is D1, D2, 3, 4, and 5. That's the only thing I don't know now. And so all I have to do is to solve the first five equations for D1, 2, 3, 4, 5 prime, and then use those equations to get um, this Q6 prime, this reaction force. Any questions on that? Uh, this is a little bit complex. I understand that. Um, but like I said before, if you understand the process, that's really what matters. I want you to understand the process. That, that's really what I care about. Um, but, but again, after this class, if I was you, I'll spend another hour trying to revisit what, we, what we've learned here. Otherwise, you will forget what was discussed here, okay? So I really recommend that. It will be of great value to you. Now, how do I do that in Abacus? Because it's kind of fun to do things two ways, one theoretically, and then well, I don't know if you call, consider this fun, but it's, it's a good opportunity to learn, right? And so uh, the way to do this in Abacus is the following. So how many nodes I have? I have one, two, three, four, five. It's the, same, it's the same problem I gave you before, but the only difference is I'm not applying a downward, downward force here anymore. I'm just applying, uh, I want things to be inclined in a surface so that this node only moves uh, inclined on that surface. So everything is the same. The only thing I'm going to do is create a node set. And a node set is, is, is just a fancy way of saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to name this node with a name. I'm going to give it a name. So node number three, number three node number three, I'm going to call it skewed. So I call it n set comma n set equals skewed. That's the way you name that node and you give it a name. That's how you do that. So node three. I wanted to give it a name, and I thought of the word skewed. I don't know why, but that's what I give. So skewed. So the next step is I want to transform. I want to transform the behavior of that node, n set equals skewed. So trans star transform, comma, n set equals skewed. What I'm going to do here is provide, provide, uh, basically, and now I have to draw it here so you can see it. Uh, hopefully, this will show up in the video. Um, so this is a global coordinate system, x and y. And what I provi I'm providing this vector, x prime, and I'm providing that vector, y prime. So the first three numbers are providing x prime, the vector x prime. And the last three numbers are providing the vector y prime. In this case, it's 45 degree. I, I made a 45 degree um, uh, a slanted surface. And of course, if you, if you know this, 0.707 is basically squared square root of 2 over 2. That's why you see that these numbers are the same. That makes sense, right? If it's 45 degrees, you expect the vector to be the same. The value is the same. And then here, uh, that's the, the y prime vector. So in this example, uh, now <coughs> the, everything else is the same. Everything else is the same. Elements, solid section, everything is the same. The difference now is that the boundary conditions. That's where the difference is. 
because I mean, if, if I cannot transform it, it's very, it will be really hard to impose a boundary condition. I don't even know how you will do it in a smart way. So star boundary, uh, nodes 1 and 4, just like before, they're fixed. No difference there. Node 3, now the cool thing is I, I can make it fixed along perpendicular to slanted surface. Perpendicular to slanted surface is degree of freedom 2, right? Because along the slanted first surface is 1, and then perpendicular to the slanted surface is 2. So degree of freedom 2 through 6, I made a 0. The only load I'm applying is minus 9,000 pounds here. Uh, I'm no longer applying. In this example, I didn't apply a load here. This is an example to show you how to deal with a slanted surface. Any questions there? I have multiple questions. So uh, mention your name and then uh, the question, please. Direction two is constrained. How would you uh, code it? So you would have. D but direction two. So the qu direction two of which node? Uh, node three. But that is what is constrained in this example. Direction, okay, so if direction one. Is you want to constrain direction one? I'm just thinking for code because you said two through six are sorry, two through six are constrained there. <laughs> if if you had say node or uh, directions one. So the question that you have for the video is that if, if this uh, constraint, so instead of having this situation, you have this situation, I think is what you're asking. Yeah. Right, so it, it, it rolls this way instead of that way. Right, is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, then you have to make sure that when you do the transformation that you have it correct. You have to do the transformation correct for that, and then you apply the, the, the boundary condition in a similar fashion. I mean, it's, it's no different. Arian. So the boundary, when you call it node 3, how come you don't call the skewed determinant? Sorry? How come you don't call uh, the I, I could have put uh, the word skewed. So the question for the video is uh, I c that you know, how come I don't call it skewed later on? I can actually call it skewed here. I could have written the word skewed here. Okay, but how does the code know that 3 doesn't refer before transformation? The code knows that, so the question is, how does the code know that 3 is referred to skewed? Is, is that the question? You're calling 3 and you're saying direction 2 is fixed. How does code know direction 2 is not because I, I transformed, we transformed node 3, right? We transformed node 3 to have a different uh, 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 coordinate system. So now it's x prime and y prime. So these are my degrees of freedom now, 1 and 2. These are my new orientations for degrees of freedom along x prime and y prime. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And Bryce, if you have, at the end of the class, I can give you a, a, another example. Because I think that will work better uh, for, for the video and then us continuing with the class. So I only have a few more minutes to go, but I want to kind of finish what I have here today. I want to show another special case that you may have. Uh, and this is another area that I think we can take more advantage of in industry and also as something I want to instill in you, is that it takes a long time to solve some of these problems because they're quite complex. And so it's important for you to find ways to simplify the problem in a way that you can make com uh, use of computational efficiency. For a problem this small, it doesn't probably matter. But for the purpose of learning, I think it's important for you to practice that. So your pr a homework problem is going to have a symmetric boundary condition or something. So you can kind of practice that. But if I give you a problem like that, and clearly it looks symmetric, then instead of modeling the full truss system, just model half. Half, and then put a, a roller here and a roller here. Right? Because this, this node cannot move to the right. This node cannot move to the right. So therefore, you should have a roller there because it's symmetric. Right? Um, the second thing is that this middle truss, because I'm cutting the whole thing in half, I need to make sure that that truss is modeled as a half, half the cross-sectional area. 
Other than that, if I solve this problem, I'll get the same answer as the full problem. And it's very important, even for aircraft models. Aircraft models are typically modeled in, they only model half of it. A full 737 model only models half of that. I mean, why model the whole thing when you can just model half and get whatever you need to get? Okay? And if you're interested, at the end of the class, I can show you how they account for uh, worst case scenarios like bank angle uh, and, and other situations that are not symmetric. Uh, they, they have ways to account for that uh, in a symmetric model. So that's a, a special case I want to show you. Uh, I want to also show you very quickly, very briefly, the homework is not going to have this. The book doesn't have it. Uh, no, I don't think either of the book has it. But I want to show you quickly how to extend this to 3D. So for 3D, uh, again, same concept. I have a, th a, a truss in, in 3D, x, y, and z. Uh, and you, it's the same formula, same formula as before. Uh, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use direction cosines uh, to represent the behavior. Uh, so I have this del jx. And I'm going to break it up into djx, djy, and djz. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, how you relate del jx to these d's, which are global, can be expressed in this manner. These are direction cosines, uh, which can be uh, calculated if you know the coordinates here, you know the coordinates here, then the cosine of theta x is basically uh, the subtraction of the x direction of this guy and that guy uh, divided by the length of that truss. That will give you the cosine of theta x and then so forth, cosine theta y, cosine theta z. So that will give you that formula. Uh, del jx is the one, um, um, sorry, del ix was the one here, and then del jx is the one here at the top. But basically it's the same, same thing, right? Same formula. So because it's almost the same formula, I can put a matrix notation. So del ix, del jx, and I'll relate it to the vector, global vector. Uh, DIX, DIY, DIZ, that's, those three are for this corner here, I. And then uh, D, uh, DJX, DJY, DJZ, these three corresponds to the global uh, deflections at J, not J. And do you agree that if I multiply this by that, I get these two equations? Look at it carefully. I'll give you 20 seconds. Can you see that the first row? times this column gives me the first equation. The second row times this column gives me the second equation. Do you see that? Yeah. Uh, let's call this T, this transformation matrix T, OK, 2 by 6. I'll call this D, vector D, and this del, just like before. No difference. Let's, uh, let's now look at force. Same thing. With force, I'm going to take the local force that goes along the truss. And I'm going to decompose it into the three directions, OK, using the direction cosines. And I know the cosines from here, from these formulas. So I have that now. The relationship of local forces and global forces are basically, sorry, not, th these are local forces. All these are local forces. These are represented in local coordinate system. These are represented in the global coordinate system. So, I'm sorry if I'm saying global forces. It's not correct, OK? So, so, so pardon me there. Uh, but if I multiply this by that, I get these two equations. And I'll call this F, I'll call this T, and I'll call this F. All right, next step. F equals K times delta. And you know K prime. K prime was given here, right here. So that's F, K times delta. That's this, this equation here. Um, but I'll do everything in matrix notation so we can quickly do it. F equals K prime delta. Use this relationship. Del equals TD. F equals TF. So I put this one there on F, so TF. Uh, and then for delta, I'll put TD. So I get that. Now I solve uh, for F by inverting this. And the inverse of T is T transpose. So that's why you see T transpose there. So now my stiffest matrix. Global stiffest matrix for 3D problem is given by that. And now uh, I've done the operation here for you. I have this times that times that. And I get a 6 by 6 matrix, uh, hopefully 6 by 6, because I have 6 degrees of freedom. Look at it. 
uh, one, two, three, and then I have the same ones here, one, two, and three. So now the code number, the code numbers for a trust element in 3D goes one through six, one through six. In fact, in fact, if you write a code for 3D instead of 2D, I'll double the points. Okay? I'll double the points. Um, sorry? For the trust problem. If your code works for 3D, I'll double the points. Okay. Um, any questions so far? I'm almost done. Two more minutes. I know it's been two hours, but that's how my classes go. Uh, the force equilibrium. Let me choose a, a, a row of forces, and uh, I'll choose row I. Row I. So if I look at row I, K times D times F, and I'll look just row I. So I multiply it and I get that, right, for rho i. Uh, I'm going to apply a unit displacement at degree of freedom j. So, so and everything else is zero. So when I, uh, if everything else is zero, that's zero, that's zero. And then somewhere in between, whatever has j, uh, that displacement I'm going to make it one. So would you agree that everything else goes to zero then, and I get f i equals k i j? One more time. So if I look at a row on a stiffness matrix, stiffness matrix times D equals F, the deflection equals the force vector. If I, if I multiply uh, um, K times D, I will get F, right? Uh, I will choose row I. And I chose row I, uh, generally speaking, OK? Now what I'll do, I'll set, I'll set degree of freedom J so I'll set one of these guys, basically, one of them. I'll set it to 1. And everything else is 0. If I set degree of freedom j somewhere in between, do you agree there's a kij somewhere? Right? But everything else I'm setting to 0. So all those go to 0, that goes to 0. So I get fi equals kij. I get that. So the, the thing I want to explain here is that uh, the physical significance of the stiffness matrix particularly a component of the stiffness matrix, Kij, is that Kij is a force at degree of freedom i, a degree of freedom i, so that's the degree of freedom i, because that's the row I selected, uh, due to a unit deflection, unit deflection at degree of freedom j. Right? So degree of freedom j, I put it 1, uh, while keeping all others to 0. This is another method to develop the stiffest matrix. You can actually do this uh, also. You can develop the full stiffest matrix by doing this. And this method uh, um, is, is used in, in civil engineering or structural analysis, structural matrix analysis. Uh, coefficient of influence method uses something very similar. So, so I'm just trying to explain the physical significance of that. Um, if you still have questions on this, we can discuss it at the end of the class. Okay. With that said, that's the last slide. So I've gone through 60 slides today, plus maybe other 20. <laughs> so you have a lot of work to do. And I'm going to post the homework. I'm going to post the homework related to these stresses today. So you have two weeks. Because you have a homework due next Thursday, right? So the homework related to this will be due, due not next Thursday, but the following Thursday. So you have plenty of time so that if you finish the spring homework, you can start working on this one, OK? Uh, so that's my goal, is to keep moving along, and, and then hopefully you can, you know, hopefully you have enough time to, to also have fun. It's important to also have fun uh, outside of work, right, or, or, or class. So thank you very much for listening. You have a great weekend, and uh, talk to you on, on Tuesday, all right? And I'll be here for another half hour or one hour, whatever time is needed to answer questions.